one into effect last month, where on his last month. Uh, so she'll help bring some of those conversations full circle um, in order to help you in those areas. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. And just know that this is the microphone for the recording. Okay, and the events are right here. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to stand for a moment, please. And I'm going to play some music. And I'm going to show you what we do in every single one of our faculty and resident um, courses. OK? So this is what we do. And, and so in Kaiser Permanente, we thrive in almost every meeting that we hold. So for the next minute, I'm going to ask all of you, instead of just dancing in place, oh no, no, no. <laughs> oh no, we don't want that. Stop calling. Okay, um, that would be really bad news. Okay, so I'd like you to come out from underneath the, uh, from your seats and um, show me your favorite sports. Okay, I'm gonna start with tennis. Mine is tennis. Okay, so now let's all play tennis. Okay, let's play tennis. Let's play tennis. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna shift it. What's yours? Basketball. Now we're over to do basketball. Come on, let's see those hoops. Okay. Okay. What's yours? Golf. Golf. Oh. Okay. A little bit harder. Okay. Especially in this space. Okay. Someone shout one over here. Baseball. Baseball. Okay. Now you're gonna catch or you're gonna throw or you're gonna bat. Right. All right. Something else. Soccer. Soccer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey. A little hard and high heels. Okay. What is yours? Football. Whoa. Way to go. Okay. Football. Okay. Okay. No tackling. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's have another one. Swimming. Swimming. Okay. Could you say swimming? Okay. Let's do it to the music. <laughs> yeah. It changes the dynamic, doesn't it? A little bit. Okay, one more. Volleyball. Volleyball. Here we go. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Give yourself a hand. It's a great way to kick it off. And if you can imagine us doing the exact same thing in new resident orientation, where we welcomed over 140 new residents and fellows in new resident orientation in downtown San Francisco. Our CEO of the Permanente Medical Group, who oversees 6,000, no, I'm sorry, 9,000 physicians um, in Northern California was there too. Well, it got so engaged that residents started a conga line. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tiny bit worried that he might be offended um, that we're doing a conga line at new resident orientation, <laughs> but not at all. Because one of his pillars uh, for the medical group is the joy in meeting uh, of medicine. Again, my name is Teresa Azevedo. I'm the DIO and the associate director um, for UME and GME undergraduate and graduate medical education. Um, they recruited me 13 years ago. My background is starting nonprofits. And so at one time I was the executive director for three nonprofits when UC Davis knocked on my door and said, could you read the green book and figure out the right nonprofit um, structure to create for our surgery program? So leading to where I am today and talking with you, it's been a journey. Um, and how many of you have already applied for residency programs? Okay, how many of you will be applying in the next year? Okay, and how many of you that raised your hands, how many programs do you have on site already? It's our first one. It's your first one. Yeah. Okay, it's the first one for all of you. You're so fortunate to have this workshop. We just kind of had to figure it out back in the day 30 years ago with a literal green book. And I'm dating ourselves <laughs> a little bit. Kiki is my hero, by the way, uh, and master in UME and GME and to where we are today. Trying to figure out what the rules are and what they mean can be very difficult. So if you know anything about me, and I know some of you look very familiar to me, uh, and so maybe we've met in different forums and different conferences. Um, but in, what you'll uh, want to know about me is that I always like to think what's behind the policy, and let's think ahead of the policy. What can we do to interpret the policy as in our roles as 
CFOs or as uh, marketing um, leaders or in human resource management or in policy leadership because in your role you do all of the above and you'll be expected to do all of the above in launching residency programs. I'm actually going to start with some case studies. So I'd like this three, uh, maybe the two of you to join, just roll your chairs to the tables closest to you. And I'd like this group, I'm going to set up a, a case study for you. And I'll give you the instruction. For the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you the, the first scenario, which is it's a resident who is being asked to work from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. <laughs> which is a, an allowable 12-hour shift. And he doesn't want to work that shift because he wants to have dinner with his loved one. Instead, in order for him to have wellness, he needs to be home at 7 o'clock. What would you do? OK, that's your scenario. <laughs> Number two, you have a newly matched medical student who is a condition of employment has um, uh, the drug testing as part of the condition of employment. Um, she has screen failed positive for marijuana. In the state of California, marijuana is legal. And so what would you do in the case that a medical student matches with you in the NRIP and screen is positive if in the state where it is legal? What would you do? What are some of the policies? And the third group, um, you have new residents. It's a new program. Uh, all of the residents got together before they even start. And you're, you're the program director. And it's just, you know, it's a program that's well. And they've told you that they don't want to take home They don't want to work on the weekends. Okay? And they don't want to do that. They have to accept it. They have their contract and they are on the same contract. They said this is two weeks before they actually show up. They tell you, no nightclub, no phone call, all the residents, all of their care patients, and some And they don't want to work with them. What was your last one? Oh, your last one? What was that? No nightclubs, no phone call. And then working on the weekend. Yeah. So those are three then we'll come back. Suck it up better to put something in your favorite respect. Your bias is showing me so your generation. I know, right? Yeah, I know. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm playing. I know you're playing. You can be these are Oh, I bet they are. Yeah, I bet they are. Yeah, I bet they are. And these are all true in your resource. Three ways. I have dealt with them for the marijuana. And then we I'm going to walk by and let a lifeline to ask any questions, any clarifying questions. Yeah, we have all to be one button. I think we
Yesterday, somehow I might have blurted out that selling marijuana would be a revenue generator for residency programs. I might have blurted something like that out. So. <laughs>
ACGME requirements for too long because I know Kiki covered this very well yesterday. Um, then we'll talk about Kaiser Permanente Northern California GME. We'll talk about the clinical learning environment uh, and the CLEAR report that was uh, presented uh, from 2018. And then we'll share the next steps. So the ACGME requirements from an institutional perspective, talk about well-being. Uh, and what our responsibilities are. And I know that you covered this in general yesterday, Kiki, um, that it is our jobs as uh, DIOs, as institutional managers, or whatever your title might be collectively, that we all are responsible for monitoring um, the fatigue, burnout, which is, a question, which is a term we don't often use in Kaiser Permanente, and then, um, what are the areas of non-compliance um, in your institution? Um, you must educate faculty members and residents in the identification and the symptoms of burnout. So, uh, we've had three site visits in three months, and we're going to have another two next month, and another one after that, because we're in program growth mode. So when I am on the other side of the table with a reviewer and they say, what do you do in the area of wellness? Um, how do you monitor faculty fatigue uh, and depression and substance abuse? And if I just said that we have programs without measuring outcomes, then uh, that's, that's not very helpful just to show a, a menu. Um, and so I'm going to share with you what we do in Kaiser Permanente, what we've done well, but I'm also going to share with you what we have learned and we haven't done so well. Now, I know Kaiser Permanente is seen as both the hero and the adversary to a lot of the teaching health centers. Okay. I heard some giggles, right? Okay. I know that. 
we know that. But please know that we are your partners also in education. Um, and I'm here today to share that with you and provide resources to you as well. The ACGME requirements um, also state that uh, they are to alert you, uh, the program director, uh, and other members um, when you see signs of burnout or depression and when you notice the signs. Now, working with physicians who self-identify as being burned out or fatigued is very difficult for their threshold of performance is really high in what they expect of themselves. That's the nature of the profession. So for a group of residents, when I meet with residents and I say, how do you express burnout to your colleague uh, or not being well? And they say, well, you know, Teresa, I don't. Because if I do that and I go home, then I'm leaving my team to do all of my work, and I feel badly about that. How can we create a culture that recognizes the need for our residents, our fellows, and our faculty to be able to speak up in a just culture and do something about it? So in Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, graduate medical education, whoops, we are located in seven regions. Um, we have UME, actually, graduate medical education sponsored programs in four of our regions. In Northern California is where it started in Oakland 72 years ago with our first internal medicine residency program before ACGME was even created. In Northern California, we have uh, 1,700 total trainees and 21 medical centers. Uh, we have 350 of our own sponsored trainees in a variety of programs. And we're adding about 100, it's a conservative amount, 100 to 150 new residents and fellows between now and 2023. So we're in program growth mode. We're over cap. Um, and a lot of people don't know that we're doing this. So why are we doing this? Just this year alone, we submitted three new residency applications and four new fellowship applications. Next year it will be the same, as well as non-ACGME accredited programs in addiction, medicine, and HIV, and other areas in need. We also have 800 medical students in Northern California, and so as DIO, I'm responsible for the wellness of all of these trainees. We pay UC Davis for over 65 FTEs that rotate through our greater Sacramento Valley, where you are today. And why do we do that? It's because our partners at UCSF, Stanford, and UC Davis, they don't have the primary care environment, or didn't at the time when they knocked on our door many years ago. And they wanted to teach primary care to their specialized uh, residents. We're now seeing family medicine grow in the medical um, school environments. We're really happy about that. Um, we actually matched somebody from Stanford into our family medicine program in Napa Solano. Who would have thought that we would recruit somebody from Stanford into a family medicine program? We're excited to see that change. Um, and I see you kind of snickering over there because Stanford's not well known for primary care. But that's why we, we have uh, so many trainees in our system. Because one resident can be 12 different rotations, that's also why we have so many trainees listed. I mentioned to you uh, that at New Resident Orientation that we danced with all of our new uh, medical students who came to us and now are PGY1 residents. That's um, Dr. Isaacs right there, um, uh, standing in front of all of the residents. And he truly does believe, so it starts from the top, wellness has to start from your C-suite, um, from your CIO, from your CNO, from your CEO. And Dr. Isaacs, when we asked him for a quote for our website, um, he said, a vital key to fostering wellness, professional satisfaction, and sustainable careers is to adopt a purposeful approach to supporting physicians and staff in our day-to-day -day work. We want our physicians at the center of cohesive teams that use innovative approaches to operations and allow doctors to be doctors. 
Now, how many of you have heard at nauseum, really, the workforce shortage that's pending? Okay. That creates a little bit of angst in all of us, not only for us, we're responsible for finding positions for our teaching health centers, for our hospitals, for our communities that we serve, but it also causes a lot of angst for our doctors who are providing care. Now, if you look at the number of PGY1s who matched in the 2019 match, there's 35,000 PGY1s that matched. And if we are told that we're going to have a workforce shortage in California, 26,000, that means we only have, you do the math, you know, not too many to provide care, right? So this is going to also have an impact on the wellness that we feel uh, in our environments. So that's also why this is a topic for ACGME and a topic for you today. So in Northern California, when the requirements first came out, the institutional requirements, I said, okay, I'm going to do what any reasonable person would do. I'm going to catalog what we're doing. I'm going to throw it on the website. And I'm going to say, hey, look, this is what we're doing. And that's exactly what we did. But then we went a little bit deeper. <laughs> the first area is, is self-education. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, self-assessments uh, that you have at your fingertips. If you don't, email me. They're also on the KP website. The requirements state that you must have tools for your residents to use to diagnose, not diagnose, but to assess their own self-depression. So we can provide that resource to you. ACGME on their website also, thank you, also has a, um, a survey. The LIFE curriculum, um, have you heard about the LIFE curriculum? Yeah, from I think we may, have, we may put it in here, but I don't The LIFE curriculum was created through a grant from the Harvard Macy Foundation to Duke University. Um, they lost all of the curriculum a few years ago with the Sandy Hurricane, hurricane and they just recently put it back on their servers. I contacted them two years ago, and I asked if we could uh, put it back on our website, just as Stanford does and other sites, and they said, by all means, yes, it's an open source. So we would recommend that you put the LIFE curriculum link on your websites for your residents. So every year, as I've told you, we have reason, uh, regional orientation. At our regional orientation, we teach our residents how to monitor, how to recognize the signs of fatigue. Um, we provide $65 a month for them to go to a gym. And I'll tell you, this is the most popular thing of, of the benefits that we provide. Now, $65 does not seem like a lot maybe to those in the room, but it is to our residents because this sends a message to them that we believe in their wellness and we want them to spend time taking care of themselves. Okay. When I uh, visit uh, residents in the medical centers, I often ask, when is the last time you've been to the dentist? Okay, it's kind of an odd question, right? Uh, I hope all of you go at least every six months. But I can tell you that some of our residents who are PGY fours and fives haven't been in four or five years, right? Because, again, they don't want to disappoint the team and take time off. So we instituted two half days off each year for wellness appointments. Again, it is a way that we can show our, um, our support for wellness. Do we monitor what they do in that time? Of course not. No, they can go to yoga, they can get their car fixed, they can go hang out at the beach. It doesn't matter to us, but it sends a message. Um, we also have on our website healthy workplace activities, you know, kinds of permanente, of course, um, one moment meditation, instant recess, fitness at work. We even have a website called Find Your Words to uh, normalize uh, and open the conversation about depression. For those who are too fatigued to go home, we provide Uber or Lyft or overnight accommodations. Um, 
operationalizing these things can take a little bit of time. Um, so we just reimburse our residents for that instead of having the property known. We also have uh, social wellness events. Um, we have picnics, uh, games, and sporting events. Um, sometimes our leadership will go to each of the medical centers and we'll have pizza and ask your leadership any kind of questions so that we collapse that hierarchy. We also have physicians who open up their home. Um, we have um, a resident band that plays uh, in Oakland periodically, which is pretty awesome. When I hear about these opportunities for our residents, I'm just I'm very, very pleased. This is an, an idea that I came up with when I started in KP. Um, these are learners who are identified by their program directors as needing additional support, and then they're referred to me. Because I noticed that it wasn't until their PGY2 or third year that our program directors found that some of our learners weren't progressing as they needed to. Um, and they didn't reach out to me until then. So I thought, you know what? We had to terminate one resident that I consider is our failure. It was a resident who didn't show up at one of our rotating uh, affiliates in the NICU and failed to show twice, and we terminated that resident. I will never forget that resident because it taught me that we failed that resident by not finding out why and what he needed. And so I started the external coaching program. Um, and so far, we have an average of 5.8 residents per year. We have three residents in the coaching program now who are all PGY1s. Okay. So the outcome is out of between 2015 and 2019, We've had 20 out of 23 residents stay with us. Okay. This is this is pretty big, considering in the previous time we the number was lower. Um, we've had one resident withdraw due to personal issues, and two resident contracts were not renewed for reasons that I won't go into right here. Lisa? Yes. What kind of person or entity is that external coach, and what's the scope of what they'll coach them on? Hey, I'm glad you asked. Is that the next slide? There we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I planted her. <laughs> hey, well, funny that you should ask, Kiki. Uh, and, and please, ask questions along the way. Uh, some of the common themes, we started with the ACGME uh, confidence and requirements. And what are the areas that we want um, to, to find uh, or at least coach our residents about? Some of the common themes we found is our residents have trouble managing anxious feelings. Um, they are fatigued and stressed. Um, the personal and social awareness. Sometimes they're really nervous about transitioning from PGY1 to PGY2, or even medical student to resident. Um, another common theme is they feel like they're going to fail. They're going to fail their families. Some residents might not want medicine, but they felt pressure to succeed in their family. Um, prioritizing work and then also timeliness. The key areas of uh, coaching have been professionalism, interpersonal communication, how to manage personal energy, confidence building, and physician leadership. I'm going to pause here for a moment. And I want to talk to the group who had the resident who wanted to be home with his family at 7 o'clock for dinner every night. So their case was the resident worked from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, a 12-hour shift, which is allowable according to the work hours, and wanted to be at home because they thought that was part of their wellness, went to the external coach that uh, this program is just too rigorous and it's not uh, a, a program of wellness. What would be your recommendation? So the little information we had, uh, first and foremost, we want to be clear about um, our restrictions and expectations of the residency program so that we can know uh, what our expectations are from them um, on that end. Um, analyzing the needs, figuring out what administration may be what they do make those accommodations, um, the effect that it'll have on other staff, their patient load, uh, 
even considering temporary accommodations. Since it was only a month, we were thinking, well, maybe there might be a compromise we can make to uh, make it a week or two. Other suggestions were, you know, maybe uh, you know, uh, invite the family to come uh, for dinner uh, one day at the facility or some kind of outing or something like that, too. Um, of course, we had also being clear about the limitations, of course, and that effect that I don't have one really witness to. But just trying to compromise and examine fairness across the board, um, trying to make sure that, you know, if it is a case of burnout, it doesn't affect other staff who are going to have a dominant effect. Excellent. Those are all, can everyone hear all of the comments? Those are all of the areas that we talked about that he didn't feel that he could manage his personal energy between life and home and felt very guilty for not being there at the dinner hour. And we coached the resident, we coached the, uh, the program director, what could we do according to the acg requirements? I, uh, whenever I get a request like that, I triage it in academic law and employment law. What are our employment requirements? As a PGY-1 resident, he's not entitled to FMLA if he needs to take extra time off, right? But sometimes FMLA needs to be pushed into the PGY-1 year if they need extra time because it runs for suicide depression. So there are some things at play that we might not know. And we might also want to create a spouse information communication group. So that person feels included because he might feel stress between both work and home. Um, so that's a real case. And we, uh, we actually got to the place that you recommended. We gave, we changed his rotation schedule a little bit so that he could flex out a little bit, but also had it for a limited period so it didn't let down the team and we didn't have the chaos in the rotation schedule. Can I ask a question? Yes. Like, my thoughts are, you know, where there's the accommodation because someone's having a hard time, and then there's, like, this new culture of work, um, like, that they, that students and residents feel like they don't need to work as hard as we all did in the past. So, like, where's the balance? Because if someone's like, I'm depressed, I might quit. I'm like, okay, we'll make you an accommodation. But often I've heard from students this new culture of, like, that doesn't work for me, and I need more balance because I don't think we should be working that hard. I'm not having a hard time, but I just don't believe in 12-hour shifts. So that's kind of where, like, my, you know, like, where where do you balance that? Um, I am so excited you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I really am because I am doing a big study right now on generational differences in the workplace. Um, and how we can look at the generation in the workplace from a variety of perspectives, from faculty, from leadership, and from residents and medical students, because that's what really we're talking about. How can acg &E and how can we, as people who are implementing these policies, think that the downstream effect is not going to be medical students and residents coming to us saying, wait, I want to change the smorgasbord of training. ACGME tells us what we have to do and what we have to submit and what our outcome measures need to be. Yet we have a new group saying, you've told me that I need to take care of my wellness. I'm telling you what my wellness is. And so you need to work around me. So I'm going to skip to their, um, <laughs> their problem. And I'm going to actually help you out with this one. So they have a brand new program and they have brand new residents who contacted the program director and said, I don't want to take home call, I don't want to work weekends, and I don't agree with the night float uh, in the ED rotation. And so what did you decide? Well, I think we had, you know, since we're a new program, <laughs> the first thing we're going to do is, again, present the contract and we are assuming that these I don't like to assume, but you're assuming that these residents, they receive their contract and they had opportunity to review what's meant in that contractual agreement. And um, we hope that within that, it specifically states what the expectations are for the program and curriculum. And that includes, or may include, for sure, the third weekend, uh, night call. However, we do want to give the residents opportunity to voice their concerns. Mm -hmm. 
and to share with us why why they have some of these feelings and anxieties. Um, and also kind of be able to give them options for you know letting them know that these um, with their schedule fill out, these know within their locations when they're going to probably take on call during a certain time or uh, be booking weekends on a certain location or hospital all as well. So, but that's part of the contract, that's part of their job. So and make that decision if they're going to be able to comply and work with us to cover those things. And we probably just want to talk to them about the wellness program that we offer as well. I think you had mentioned about like when you're doing um, particular shifts, you would take calls during that time. Just the give and take of what this looks like realistically for all residents and pretty much all programs. Um, so the expectations that are required of us and that. Mm -hmm. This is an audacious kind of comment to receive that from a group of residents before they start, right? Mm -hmm. You have them located and they send an email that says we would only be willing to do X, Y, and Z in a non-union environment. So we can't because mm -hmm. our we're non union um, group in Northern California because our we think so this is a true story. This happened to me this academic year. Um, it's a true story. Branding program. Yes. Um, and I was flabbergasted. And I thought, how do I triage this one? To your point, okay, that um, our residents are coming to us with, uh, some would say, entitled. I'm not going to use that word because I believe we need to listen to the generation. The program director said uh, to me just recently, that the residents don't have a book in their particular specialty and she's aghast that they don't have this particular book and i said of course they don't they know where to look it's a different generation nobody carries books today <laughs> so <laughs> so here at play um i as an educator i need to educate our program director at that site we have thank you also a um I just got the 10 minute sign, so I'll try to, to wrap it up real, real quickly, but I want to unpack this because it's very powerful. In a case like this, you want to meet with your residents at the DIO as the leader, and you want to meet with your program director, you want to meet with the DME. You want to meet with your program director and find out what are the areas they can capitulate and what are the areas they cannot. I, I negotiated that they didn't have to take home call, and I negotiated that the night float was actually incorrectly labeled on the rotation. But what I would not capitulate is about the weekend, that our residents have to work weekends because patients are discharged seven days a week. They don't just get sick and discharged Monday through Friday. It's really important that they see a realistic environment. We can only do that if they train in a realistic environment. So I split the group in two. I split the residents in two so they didn't have the group think. And I worked with three of them at a time to really hear them. And then I met with the other three to kind of disempower the, uh, the, the group thing. Um, that was very successful. They were very antsy. Um, and then brought them together, <laughs> brought them together as a group. And then I held up the program director and I said, listen, we hear you. We hear this is what the program director is willing to do. Um, we have to also listen to what the residents are being told about their wellness. They're telling us that this would help, but why should our program have night call to learn how to prescribe to somebody on the other end for a patient? They'll learn that soon enough. Why do they need to do that in the first year of training? We did not have a good response for that. We did not have outcome measures to show them that. It's just a practice. When I hear a resident tell an attending, you don't know what it's like because I work all the time and you only work three days a week. I scratch my head, and this is true. It is absolutely what we're hearing in the workplace. So we need to listen to our residents as though they are leaders. Okay? We need to switch the bios, the, our bias, and we need to look at the neuroscience of bias and where we come from in our perceptions. And we need to look at our residents like they're the leaders and let them teach us. Let them partner with us. So when I meet with the group, I seek to understand and I look for compromise in areas that we can compromise. It is difficult and it's worth it. So that arbitration or negotiation took four hours of my day and it was worth every single bit. 
um, and difficult to impact. I have a background in labor law and HR too. Um, and so when those, those issues come up, um, yes, we have a contract, but also it's a new program and we have, we have room. So it's very difficult. Um, so I'm going to now tell you, we have resident courses. Uh, we invite our community partners to send residents to all of our courses. Um, it's very difficult for um, individual teaching health centers to have the same courses available to their residents. We're not looking to poach your residents in, uh, in any way. We're looking to share our resources. So we have residents from Contra Costa County, from uh, hopefully lifelong in the near future, from Central Valley, from all over Northern California who attend our resident courses. They're listed on our website and we have particular courses for each year. We monitor the work hours for all new programs using ResQ. It's the work hour collection platform. Um, then for existing programs, we monitor that quarterly. We have a new residency platform called Metrics, um, and it will be soon available to the public. Uh, right now we're working with them in, uh, for Kaiser Permanente. Can I just quickly ask, is that a different version of these other management software, so like innovation might have? So new innovations um, and MedHub were, we were one of the first adopters of that program. Um, and they were wonderful for a while for our needs. And then something changed and our needs grew. They could no longer meet our needs. And so in the spirit of innovation in the future and where we want to be 10 years from now, I wasn't convinced they could help us with that. So we have partnered with MedHub and um, Metrics, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Metrics, uh, created by a physician with amazing dashboards. Yeah. I knew there was a new one out. I was trying to figure out what it was. I can connect you. Yeah. It's pretty sick connecting. <laughs> I want to speak a moment about the clinical learning environment. If you haven't looked at the 2018 executive summary, the clinical learning environment measures different things than uh, your individual program requirements. Okay. Um, the findings uh, that they found in the executive summary is that uh, residents said that they will power through until the, end, uh, until the end of their rotation, but the faculty didn't think that they would power through. So there we have some incongruence in reporting um, and behavior. So we look at this very carefully. Um, the, and they've also found that clinical learning environments don't have systematic strategies and solutions on the prevention. Um, recognition of uh, fatigue and burnout. So our clear summary, we actually, five minutes, okay, we were, uh, it was pointed out that we could do better in fatigue management, we could do better in all of these areas that you see here, I won't go through all of them. So I looked at our well-being survey and I'm being very transparent in showing our dashboard. This is from our 2000 and 19 ACG survey of the residents and from January until June. You can see where we're lit up in the red. I'm not especially pleased about that. It's 0.6 deviation for those in statistics. Um, it's not hugely, you know, it's not a huge deviation, but enough to warrant attention. Um, so we are working in the area of red where they often feel emotionally drained at work. We want to certainly change that. ACGME looks at the well-being survey every year for your programs. It's one of the rubrics that they use. You will soon be putting your licensing information in the ADS on ACGME website too because they're looking at that as an outcome. So I use this dashboard every year in monitoring our programs. We also have uh, within Northern California and the physician medical group um, the joint meeting in medicine based on these three pillars. Um, where we uh, create a, a culture that supports joy and meeting, where the physicians work together to, to improve systems in a team-based setting, and that they continue to provide structure and support um, for their personal wellness so that their patients are taken care of in a safe manner. So our next steps is we are assessing our medical center and program curriculum system-wide. We're going to conduct a gap analysis on where we see our gaps in all of our residency fellowship programs, which is no small task. It's a really big task. 
Uh, we're also going to survey the residents and fellows using our own model and our own survey. And then we'll develop institutional curriculum, and then we're going to measure the effectiveness and the outcomes. Um, we started down this path, and I had to change course because we were developing the survey before assessing what we could provide to residents across our system. Um, do I have time, to, two minutes, to talk about their question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and I, I know I packed a lot in today's talk. Um, you had the residents of Springfield for marijuana, um, and they said that they use it for wellness and to reduce anxiety. Um, it was a match medical student who hadn't actually started yet in pre-screening. What do you do? Um, and we didn't have that piece of information as to why they use it, so we yeah. um, A few thoughts we had was, one, encouraging the policy change to not check for marijuana in our pre-employment um, That's thinking that it's legal in California and that it's not helpful for assessing like, uh, impaired positions. We don't think that, you know, that would do that. Um, but if we couldn't do that, um, we will. It was a suggestion that uh, maybe when they do the drug screen, there's a place to up front explain if something's going to be positive. So we're not sure if that happened or not. But then if otherwise, we would get information about the usage of the marijuana and um, if we think it would potentially impair the performance. Excellent steps. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, let me tell you that in the state of California, when you have a medical student screen fail, um, before they start in your program and they don't reveal that they have smoked marijuana and you have a drug testing policy, which we do now, which I did not want to have a drug testing policy for our residents. I actually fought it uh, and was overturned because they KP wants to drug test people at the time of employment. Why would I argue against that? Because it's a slice in time and it doesn't really show the efficacy long term. Not that I'm pro-marijuana or pro any use of anything, except for yoga, which makes me feel good, but it's not illegal. Uh, so to your particular case and with this particular medical student, they didn't reveal um, and they tested positive and it was sent out for an outside consultant review um, and it's not allowed and our policy says that if you test positive, it's not allowed and you can't hire them for one year. Um, so we have to release her from the employment contract. We also have to request be removed from the waiver. We need an NRMP waiver because when you enter in the match, it's good until September, uh, actually the end of August. You have to retain them uh, until the end of August with, unless you have just caught. I contacted the NRMP and we made it from the groundbreaking decision and I let them know hallucinogenics mushrooms are next to be legalized in California uh, or at least up for discussion to be legalized. So if we go down this path with marijuana, where are we going to, where is it going to end? So the NRMP saw the wisdom in that, not just in California, but other states that have the same impact. If this medical student had revealed that they used marijuana to reduce anxiety and they were requesting an accommodation, absolutely yes. We would have made every accommodation up front. So this goes just to tell you that when you interview during your interview season, you must tell them that uh, for any reason, if you test positive for marijuana, we might not be able to hire you if you have, uh, if you use, utilize a uh, company that tests for marijuana as an indicator. I hope today was helpful. I know it was a soup in the collection because wellness really is a big issue. How do you measure it? How do you demonstrate it? How do you create the culture from the onset? So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, of course. Because um, I was, someone that was saying, but I don't know where they get this information, that wellness program, like the more structured your wellness program is, the more effective. And I'm just wondering if there's any data that you're aware of, because Kaiser does so much study, like effectiveness, because there's all these programs, and everyone's thinking of your programs, but what is actually effective? You say, take a half day and do whatever, and they sit on their inbox and finish their inbox. Is that helping their wellness versus you have to do a yoga class right now? Do you know so we're 
We are, so our data shows, and we've been teaching resilience um, instead of burnout, um, because we've been meeting all of the demands with understanding what, how do you become the resilient position? How do you shift between patients and being able to be the resilient position and, and showing up in, in the moment? Um, so it's not anyone and the jokes, if that's your question. What is it? And so we, we find that resiliency is, is the answer. But when, like, the wellness things of, like, take some time off or do this versus at lunch today, we're going to help you with yoga class. Like, yes. structured versus unstructured. And it's a combination of both because we have different people wanting different things. Some don't like the group activities. They just want a gym membership to so come by. And so we're, we're kind of yeah. creating a, a potpourri of mm -hmm. options for a, a variety of learners. But there's no evidence to show what's more actually effective. You know, not yet. We're we're, we're pursuing. Sorry, sorry. I want exactly. I want to step inside. I want to see stuff. Yeah, because yeah. it's one thing. Like I want to go to my dance class three days a week, but I don't always, right? But um, so, but what, what would be most effective is whatever structure could make me go to my dance. Class. So participate in the national initiatives with ACGME and the AIAC is at the Board Independent <coughs> Academic Teaching Centers. I'm a board member of the AIAMC, and you can too. Um, so I would recommend that you join us because that's exactly what ACG means. All of us are measuring together what's it, what's it that. But we have to start somewhere with our surveys, the pre and post. If you haven't had a program yet, and most of you haven't, you will never get this time back in your teaching health center. Measure the professional satisfaction of your faculty, pre and post residents. And you're going to see the professional satisfaction spike as a result of teaching residents.